Well, this morning we found ourselves in the next to last chapter in Hebrews. We've been making our way through this marvelous book. We started all the way back in the month of June in this uh, message series called Deeper Waters. We've really tried to get out and understand the really deep truths uh, of Scripture that uh, are found in this great book. Uh, and we find ourselves this morning uh, with a subject that is really, really important for the people who received this letter, but also very important for you and me, and that is focusing on our finish line. We understand about this thing, the Christian life that we're a part of, that as we go along, we took for ways, metaphors, similes, word pictures to help us understand what it is we're all about and what it is that we've been called to do. And the Bible talks about what we've been called to do as in a race. Now, when we think about races, we think about athletic competitions. And I was thinking about this, and particularly thinking about the Olympic Games. The first Olympics that I remember watching was in 1968, happened in Mexico City. Now, <clears throat> I was 14 years old, and the, the Olympics that happened before that, 1964 in Tokyo and 1960 in Rome, I remember reading about those, and I remember some of the events that happened, but I don't know if they really were very much covered on television. If they were, I didn't see them. But I really vividly remember the games in Mexico City in 1968. They were on all day and all night for those two weeks. And there's three particular things that happened in the 1968 Olympics that are memorable, iconic photographs. One of them is this one here. The two fellows from the United States uh, 100 uh, meter dash, uh, Juan Carlos and and Tommy Smith, who during the award ceremony for the gold and for the silver, lifted up their hands with the black gloves on uh, for black power. And it never had anything like that happen in the Olympic Games. And uh, people 45 years later are still talking, you know, about that event. That was one of the things that happened. The second thing happened was Bob Beeman broke the uh, long jump record. And... Uh, the record he set there, over 24 feet, has never uh, really been approached since that day. The third event is probably one that, though, you don't know anything about. We think about Olympic Games, and we think about honoring people who win the gold for becoming the person who achieves more than anybody else in their particular event in the world. And this particular guy is remembered. His name is John Stephen Akwari. He was from Tanzania. And what's remarkable about him is that he is still remembered today not for coming in first. He's not even remembered for coming in second. What he is remembered for is coming in last place. This photograph was made at 7 p.m. in Mexico City on the 20th of October of 1968, and he's entering the stadium. By the time he came in the stadium, not only had all the other participants in the race finished, the award ceremonies were finished, all the equipment had been taken off of the field, and it's estimated there was not probably more than a thousand people left in the stadium there in Mexico City. But when he came into the stadium, people knew his coming, but they came in by a police siren. They were were escorting him in. And those who received him there that day in that stadium gave him a standing ovation. His event was the marathon, more than 26 miles. And early into the race, not more than about a third of the race, he, just, he encountered a terrible fall. He uh, gashed his head. He tore his body up in several places, especially his leg, and most seriously, he dislocated his knee. And it was the advice of everybody around him, you're out of the race. But Akwari refused to end the race. And he finished the race an hour and a half behind the guy who won the race. And when he had his press conference afterwards, and they asked him, why didn't you, you know, go get medical help and go ahead and get out of the race? This is what he said. He says, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. 
Isn't that good? Isn't that a great metaphor for you and me? Because most of us are not like the guys who can run like the wind or the guys who can soar like a bird. We're like the guy who falls down <laughs> before the race hardly gets going and are so crippled we don't even know how we're going to get back up. It's all about not how you start, but it's all about how you finish. And more importantly, it's about being sure that you are just committedly doggone certain that nothing is going to keep you from finishing this race. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying by the time you get to chapter 12. He's taken 11 chapters to try to drive home to a bunch of people who were distraught and discouraged and dismayed at how tough life had come. These Jewish Christians who had been persecuted and were under all kinds of plights, who were under all kinds of threats, and some of them were giving up. Some of them were quitting the faith. Some of them were just saying it's too hard, it's too difficult. And he writes this letter imploring them, whatever you do, don't give up and don't quit. It's all about focusing, he says here in chapter 12, on the finish line. Now, I want to read to you these first three verses of chapter 12. I'm going to, I'm going to take three messages out of chapter 12. I put those in the newsletter this week. And I want to talk about this first one today about focusing on the finish. I want you to just hear these three verses. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand throne of God. Verse 3 then, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now this is information that we need today. Because it is so easy to get weary, isn't it? From just the reality of living life. It is so easy to lose your heart. You lose your heart, you've lost everything. But we're to take note, not only from what he says here, but from John Stephen Aguari. We're not called here to say, well, didn't I have a great beginning of the race? We're called to be there at the end of the beginning of the race, at the end of the race, rather. Now, the most consistent metaphor used in the New Testament for the Christian life is a race. A race, not a sprint, but a race. Like a long-distance race. That's the best metaphor there is in the Bible. It is a race that, declares, that uh, requires that we have the discipline of an athlete, the endurance of a marathon runner, and the determination of a champion. You just can't get them to quit. You just can't give them to give up. You just can't knock them out. They just won't let it happen. And when you read those verses we read a moment ago, it's not just that we read those verses about those people back then. Those verses are for you and me. They're about the race that we're in right now. You see, when we call ourselves a journey church, we're just using the same metaphor. Paul called it a race. We call it a journey. But we're all on this individual journey, and we're on this journey collectively. It is a personal race that you're on. Nobody can run your race for you. And it is a permanent race, a race in which God intends you to stay in it all the way till you get to heaven. Now, the idea is that we are big boys and big girls. We know it's not always easy. We know it's not always going to be um, smooth sailing. We know it's not going to be without some challenges, some difficulties, some obstacles, and some frightening days. But the attitude with which you face your race is to be this one that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Don't you know the race that is run, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run your race, say it with me, in such a way that what? You get the prize. We're talking about attitude today, guys. We're talking about the focus of our mind. We're talking about the commitment of our heart that we're not going to get knocked out. Run in such a way, Paul says, to get the prize. Now, to help us get this idea about this race, he starts off with this real interesting phrase. Therefore, since we are surrounded 
by such a great cloud of witnesses. You ever notice in the races like the Tour de France, for an example, they race those where the crowds are right up against them. And you know what that does for an athlete? It, it just gives you a whole dose of enthusiasm. It doesn't matter what you do publicly, whether you're an athlete or whether you're a performer, whether you're a speaker, whether you're a teacher. It's just the mass of people that are around you and encouraging gives you extra strength and extra ability to do what you're doing. It's just a, an amazing thing when you see people out there who are really cheering for you and wanting you to do well. Our oldest son and wife and little boy live in Houston. His wife is the most non-athletic girl. I would have never thought she would do what she's done, but she's become to be a marathon runner. And uh, last Sunday there in Houston, she ran a first half marathon, 13 miles. And Joel and, and, uh, and Jacob and her mom and dad and her brother were all down there, and their job in the city of Houston was just to cheer her on. And she did it. And now she's getting ready to run a full marathon. And she loves it. And, and, it, and she talks about what the difference it made to know that all these people were there were cheering you on. Well, the idea is of that great chapter 11 we read last week is that we are to look at ourselves on the Christian life and realize all these people who have gone before us, they just aren't there as historical figures. Paul says they are like a great witness of cloud. They are, are like a, a grandstand of people from heaven that are watching you today on your journey and they are cheering you on to not give up and not quit. That's what that hall of faith is all about. You're discouraged today. You think life is not fair. From heaven above, Joseph says, don't give up and don't quit. Remember, I was falsely accused and thrown into prison in Egypt. I was accused of rape, and I was doing just the opposite. I was running away from that woman. But I ended up in prison. I did it. You can do it. That's what the Hall of Faith is about. David down below says, you're scared. You're frightened of what you're up against. Remember, I was a little kid, and I stood up against Goliath. I didn't have any business being able to win that fight, but I did because the Lord was with me. And from heaven, he says today, if God helped me, God's going to help you. Noah says, you think your job is tough? Try building an ark, buddy. Try building an ark when all your neighbors are laughing and making fun of you. Try building an ark when it doesn't rain for decades. From Noah, up above in heaven day, he says, don't let your challenge look too big to you. Moses says, you got shame, you got embarrassment about your past. He goes, I was asked to go back to Egypt, to the very place where I was wanted for murder 40 years ago. I had been in hiding out in the desert of Midian, hoping they would never find me, and God sent me back to the very place where I was wanted for murder. And he put me in front of the Pharaoh himself to say, God says, let my people go. You see, this is that great cloud of witnesses today. And whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, there's somebody up there cheering you on that's done what you're having to do right now. And so in these three verses, he says three very practical things. First of all, drop whatever's weighing you down. Now, have you ever noticed people who are in competitive racing, they don't wear a lot of clothes. And the clothes they have on don't weigh very much. I, was, I remember when I was, uh, you know, participating in sports, Man, my shoes were size 13. They weighed about 14 pounds alone. And today's shoes are, are light enough you can hold them up with a finger. All this new technology. And Paul says you've got to drop whatever's weighing you down. Throw off everything that hinders is the way it's said in the NIV. And the good news it says get rid of everything that's getting in the way. In the new uh, living translation it says strip off every weight that slows you down. Now I've got to tell you something historically. People that competed in those Grecian games back then when Paul's writing about it, it was all men, and they practically ran naked. Aren't you glad I don't have a slide of that this morning? <laughs> that wouldn't be a pretty sight. But they stripped down. I mean, everything that could potentially interfere with their ability to win the race, they took off. You want to do your race better? You want to be more effective? You want to have more success? It's time this morning to do something we need to do every once in a while, and that is to strip off all the weight that slows us down, especially that sin that trips us up. 
you got, you got to ask yourself, you know, do, am I carrying weight that I don't really need to carry? I heard about these two guys not too long ago. They're in a drugstore, and they had one of those old-timey, um, you know, weights where you put a nickel in, and you stand on and tells you how much you weigh. And one guy says to his friend, you know, Larry, I've been losing weight since Christmas. I've been on a diet. I'm going to see how much I weigh. And he got on the scales, and he goes, oh, this can't be right. I don't weigh that much. So he goes, Larry, I'm going to take my coat off, hold my coat for me, and I'm going to get back on. We got on there, and it was still too much. He says, Larry, I'm going to take my shoes off, hold my shoes, and I'm going to get on there again. And it was still too much. He says, Larry, hold these Twinkies in my pocket for me. <laughs> that's us. I mean, we're carrying stuff that's not productive to our spiritual life. We're carrying stuff that the Bible says is a weight that's slowing us down. So what do you have to do? You have to take a weight test. Let me give you four questions, four practical questions, a weight test this morning. Number one, about symbol habits, are they slowing you down? Number one, whatever your weight is, and you know what it is, by the way. I don't know what it is, but you know. We all deal with this. Number one, is it bringing you closer or farther away from God to have it in your life? That's a weight test. Number two, here's a good question. Does it control me or do I control it? Can I get an amen? Number three, does it create a, grit, a sense of guilt in my life that I'm carrying this? And number four, would it hurt my witness and reputation as a follower of Jesus if other people knew about that in my life? And those are real practical questions. And if the answer to those are yes, you've got to drop it. It's slowing you down in your race. It's interfering with your ability to do the thing that God's called you to do. So the first thing he says is drop whatever's weighing you down. Second thing he says is detach whatever makes you weary. Because here's one of the things that sin does. Sin's not only heavy, it not only entangles you, but it makes you weary. It makes you weary to carry it. NIV says that that sin that so easily entangles. The Good News Translation says that sin that holds you so tightly. The New Lambing Translation says especially that sin that trips us up. And what we call these are pet sins. They're those private secret sins. And you know how I know that you do that? And you know how I know I do that? Because he says in here, in a general way, but he says it specific to everybody, that sin that entangles you. You know, I, I, there's an old, old joke about a guy in Texas that told uh, the community he lived it next Sunday he's going to preach on every sin in the Bible. He'd count them up. There was 1,343 sins. And one guy sent him an email, says, I'm not going to be able to be there. Could you send me the list? <laughs> you know, we joke about that. But most of us don't have trouble with 95% of all those sins. But boy, those 5% or those 5 or that 3 or that 1. And what it does, it causes us real trouble. We're talking about the Olympics. Mary Decker, a name a lot of people have forgotten about, but if you were around back in the 1980s, Mary Decker was maybe the greatest female sports figure of the 20th century. Mary Decker had been running track since about 1971. In 1983, she won the gold medal at the 1983 uh, World Games, both for the 1,500 to 3,000 uh, meters. By 1984, she had set 17 world records and 36 U.S. records for her long distance running. And when the 1984 Olympics came here to Los Angeles, of all the athletes that were getting notoriety, she was right up there with all the events that finally Mary Decker was going to get a gold medal. You see, in 1972 Olympics in Munich, she was too young. When the 1976 Olympics came around, she was injured and wasn't able to run. When the 1980 Olympics came around, President Carter boycotted the Olympics and wouldn't let American athletes participate, and she got knocked out. Her last real shot was 1984, and all the eyes of the world were on her that day when she started the 1,500-meter race. And from the very beginning, she was out in the lead. But right behind her was a South African by the name of Zola Budd. 
And as they came around to turn, Zolabud was trying to get a little bit in front of her, and something happened. And Mary Decker went down. And Mary Decker went down in front of all the world to see. The camera soon moved their coverage away from who was winning the race to Mary Decker. And the images have lasted ever since. And after the race, Mary Decker said, I was right where I wanted to be in this race until I tripped. And yeah, that's the metaphor for what he's saying here in Hebrews. There's a sin. If you don't watch it, it'll knock you out of the race. If you deal with it long enough, it'll trip you up. Mary Decker, still today, holds more records than any woman to ever do what she did, but she'll never have an Olympic gold medal because she never again had the chance to run the Olympics. In the race that mattered, she tripped. If you look at the Bible... The enemy has a threefold plan of attack to get you out of the race. The first thing is to lure you just off the track. Now, he does that one or two ways. For a lot of people, he does it by adversity. You throw a little adversity at some of us, and we're just, oh, my gosh. It's too hard. It's too unfair. It's too difficult. It's too, too painful. It's too scary. It's too frightening. And we're just out of the race altogether. There are Christians all around the country today that are on the sidelines because they got knocked out by adversity other people get knocked out not by bad stuff but by good stuff by prosperity they have so much good fortune come their way they just kind of don't feel like they need the Lord anymore they kind of feel like they're bulletproof they kind of feel like they don't really have any necessity or need to look to the Lord Demas was one of those kinds of guys Paul said about Demas in 2 Corinthians Demas loved the things of the world and he left the faith and there are people who used to be in the race that aren't in it anymore because they just got so prosperous and so blessed. So the first thing the enemy tries to do is to find some way just to get you off the track. But praise God, a lot of people don't give in to adversity or prosperity. So the second thing he tries to do is what he did to Mary Decker in that race, trip you up for sin. Why, we could sit here this morning and we could all tell a story of somebody we know that we've looked up to that we had respect for, that others really believed in, and they got knocked out of the race because of personal sin. Some pastors, some teachers, some famous people, and then a lot of just people that nobody else knows but you and me. But they tripped up over sin. And it's not even enough for the enemy to trip you, then he tries to trap you through shame, through embarrassment, through public ridicule. And the idea is you fall on the track and you lay there and you don't ever get up and get back in the race again. That's what he's trying to say here. It's not enough that you get rid of the weight of things, but particularly you have to be so careful about that sin, that's what he says here, that sin that so easily entangles you. That sin that so easily trips you up. That sin that's so comfortable and so marginalized in your life and in your pattern of who you are. And eventually, if you don't watch out, it has the potential to knock you out of the race. But wait, there's more. You thought I lost this slide, didn't you? But I did it. Not only that, it's not enough that it trips us up. But trying to run the race while carrying your pet sins always leads to weariness. You know what it's like? I was thinking it's like it's like being in an airport trying to run for a flight and having all of your luggage. You ever been in that situation? That's the most wearing thing of all. Happened to me a few years ago. I came in on a, a flight uh, at a major airport, and they dumped me as far at that terminal as I could be from the next plane I was supposed to be at, and the plane came in late. They weren't the same airline, so they didn't have any knowledge of what the other was doing. This was really back in the day before there was the wheels and all the luggage I had on a heavy coat I had on a big briefcase and I had a suitcase and I literally was trying to run to the airport I thought there was a real good possibility that I was going to have a heart attack and die before I got there 
I, I mean, I, I, it, was the, it was the most arduous thing I ever did, and I finally got to the gate, and this is what I saw. You ever had that happen to you? Now, that's wearisome. But that's like physically what it's like. It's like trying to run with your ankles tied together. That sin that so easily besets us. And what he says here, if you don't watch out, you'll grow so weary that you lose heart. You've got to drop whatever's weighing you down. You've got to attach from whatever is tangling your legs up. And the last thing he says is you've got to direct your focus instead upon Jesus. You see, our goal is to run until we finish our race. And some of us are just starting our race. Some of us have been on the race a long time. Some of us got a lot of years to go, and some of us are pretty close to the finish line. We never know, do we? But our goal is however much time is left to not quit, to not get knocked out, to not be disqualified before we get to the end of the race. Now, our example is to look at what Jesus did in going to the cross. He never gave in, he never gave out, and he never gave up. Our example is Paul. Paul gets to the end of his life. He's in prison in Rome. He's days away from being beheaded, and he writes the last letter he'll ever write is to 2 Timothy, and here's what he says in chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. He says to Timothy, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. I know the time of my death is near. You want to know a great life verse? It's verse 7. And here's what Paul said. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And I kept the faith. Man, that's as good as it gets, guys. They may never build any statues. They may never write any books about any of us. There may never be a monument about us. But you want to know what your goal is as a believer in Jesus Christ at the end of your life? To be able to say, I fought a good fight. I didn't give in to it. I didn't switch sides. I didn't try to play it on both ways. I fought a good fight against the enemy. I finished my race. I didn't give up. I didn't quit. I didn't get out. And I never, ever lost faith in God. That's it. That's our goal. That's your goal. That's what God's called us to do. Well, how do you make certain that you finish your race? Well, he says it in verse 2. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Look at him as you're an example. That's what he says in 12 too. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Roger Bannister, May 6, 1954, does something no man had ever done before. You remember what Roger Bannister did? Broke the four-minute barrier for the mile. People used to think it was physically impossible for a human being to put that much strain upon their heart. You know what's amazing? That record went on for hundreds of years, at least for a hundred years that people were keeping records, believed it was impossible, and then 16 other people broke it in the next year. Once one person broke it. But he's the first guy to do it. One of his most famous races, he was up against an Australian. The Australian is one in the race. You can see Bannister's not in first place. They get within about uh, less than a quarter of a mile from the finish line. And Bannister's coming up on this guy. And the Australian is leading the race, been leading the whole way. And at the last minute, the Australian takes his eye off the finish line and looks over his left shoulder. And when he does, Bannister passed him on his right. And the guy would have won the race except what? He took his eye off the finish line. You see, that's a great picture for you and me. How do we keep from being disqualified? How do we keep from being knocked out? How do we keep from losing attention of what we ought to be about? We keep our eyes on Jesus. We keep our eyes on him as our example. We keep our focus on the Lord. 
Corey Ten Boom said, look within and you'll be depressed. She said, look without and you'll be distressed. But look at Jesus and you'll be at rest. He is our picture in every situation and every circumstance that in every kind of adversity, he stayed focused. Jesus said, I have set my eyes upon Jerusalem like flint. That's the little translation in the New Testament. I mean, I am so focused, nothing will make me break what I need to do. So why do you look to Jesus? Well, here's what the author of Hebrews says. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know what that means? It means that Jesus started the race, he's the author of it, and it means he finished the race. He is the perfecter of it. He is the finisher of it. And because he finished the race, he will enable you to finish your race. One of the great verses of Scripture is Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He has a plan to get you to the finish line. If you'll trust him, if you'll follow him, if you'll hang on with him. Jesus not only knew how to start a race and to finish it, he knows how to coach you and me to successfully finish the race that God has laid out before us. I don't know what your race is, but I know you have a race to run. I have determined that the race for me is this church. I have determined that I'm not going to live anywhere else but Southern California until the day I'm not able to do this anymore. My, my race is to build a church that's healthy, that's organic, that is relevant, that it reaches broken people, and that someday someone will come after me and will reap the fruits of all the labor that we've done all these years. That, that's the race that I know I'm supposed to run, and I'm committed to finishing this race. I don't want to get disqualified. I don't want to get knocked out. I don't want to go do anything else. It took me a while to come to that point and place in my life, but I know that's my race. My race is to be a good husband. My race is to be a really good grandfather to the kids that come into our family. So I've got to stay focused on what I'm supposed to do. My, my race is to build really good relationships with men that God brings into my life, and I'm getting the privilege to do that. And it takes a while just to establish those and to build on those. You've got to know what the race is that God's called you to do. And then you've got to say, I am going to be committed to finish what God's called me to do. It may be for you that it's about a relationship. It may be for you about a job. It may be for you about, about a child or, 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 or someone in your life like that. I don't know what it is, but you've got something God's called you to do and to be. And you commit this morning to... Focus on Jesus and finish what God's called you to do. Several years ago, I was a youth pastor in Houston. We had a very, very gifted and bright kid that came out of our youth group. And he, and he went on to graduate from Baylor, and a few years later, he went to Harvard and got his MBA. His name's Kevin. And before he finished Harvard, he invited me to come up there. And Harvard is one of four schools in the Boston area that sits on the Charles River. If you've ever been up there, you've probably seen it. It's a beautiful sight. And I was on this bridge, Harvard Bridge, they call it, over the Charles River. And I was looking over there, and I saw something so cool that you don't see a lot, except in that part of the world. I saw a group of men go by in a long boat, and they were all rowing together. And what I saw was the Harvard rowing team. And I didn't know much about it, but I saw a guy there, and I didn't know what he did. I didn't know what you called him. And he was doing what this guy's doing right here. There is a technical name for this person in a boat, a crew that's rowing. He's called the coxswain, C-O-X-S-W-A-I-N. His job is to sit there and to yell. Wouldn't that be a good job? To yell at all the guys that are rowing. Now, that's the coxswain right there. Now, you know what's amazing about this sport? Is that everybody's rowing, and everybody's rowing together, and everybody's trying to row faster than the other boats to get to the finish line. But guess what? While you're rowing, you know what you can't see? 
You can't see the finish line. Because you know where the finish line is? It's behind you. Guess who can see the finish line? The coxswain. So while they're rowing, he's sitting there and in giving instructions and in giving encouragement and giving reminders. You're a lot closer than you think you are. Here's what you need to do right now to win this race that we're in together. And that is why we look to Jesus. Because he sees your finish line and he is your coach and he is your encourager. Let's pray together.